Welcome to Black Writer Therapy, a podcast where Black women writers are invited to sit on the proverbial couch, have a cup of tea, and share the stories behind the stories, and what it really takes to write books about Black women in an industry that still prefers white as the default. I'm your host, published author, and unlicensed therapist, Alishan. Black Writer Therapy is now in session. Hey y'all, it's your girl Alishan, and today I am actually in Colorado at a podcasting convention. So I thought I would let you guys hear one of my favorite episodes from a podcast that I did about five years ago. The Enchanted Beast podcast was my first foray into podcasting. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode, Let It Go Woman. In this episode, Ella asks, how do you let go of people, ideas, practices, beliefs that no longer contribute toward your highest good? It's time to make the truly hard choices. And now, your host, Ella Sean. Hello, welcome back to the Enchanted Forest. We are back, season five. Can you freaking believe season five? Well, we're here. So uh, this, this season's theme is living for joy. Living for joy. I figure since it's been a minute and, you know, I need to work my way back into doing this, I'm going to open with a little joke. What did the time traveler say to her future self? Yes, this is me taking a break, waiting patiently for you to answer in your head or aloud while you're driving. Okay. Give up? She said... When the past calls, let it go to voicemail. That bitch has nothing new to say. (laughs) No. The truth is, many of us need a future version of ourselves to come and remind us to do exactly that. Right now, in our present, right? Because sometimes... It comes calling. The past comes calling. Past hurts. Past doubt. Past shame. Past guilt. Past confusion. Past chaos. Past, I don't know, shit, right? It comes and it's calling us. And what do we do? We pick up the phone and we answer immediately. Hello? Oh, it's you from 1985 when I was really, really not feeling my best self. Yeah, what? What did you have to? Oh, the same thing you told me in 85. Yeah. Um. Why can't we just let it go to voicemail? Why can't we just let that shit go to voicemail and not pick it up? Because obviously it's not going to say anything that we already haven't heard. But no, we cannot do that. We just can't do it. We just can't let it go. We have to hear what it's going to say. And why? Why do we need to hear it? And I know this is the kind of stuff that runs through our minds when our past comes calling. What if it has something new to say, Ella? I don't know. What if it, what if it's changed for the better? What if it's grown, Ella? What about second chances, Ella? What about those? And you know what I say to second chances? I 
I say, fine, I'm all for second chances. I am, because you know, I am not a complete bitch. I am all for second chances. However, I'm not here for five, six, seven, eight, 25, 3,000 of them. What is a second chance? I mean, it is pretty self-explanatory, but most of us, most of us don't pay attention to the actual words. That's why you need a word nerd girlfriend. And that's why I'm here. What is a second chance? According to Miriam Webster, a second chance is the opportunity to try something again after failing one time. By its very definition, a second chance is only offered one time after failing at a thing. Yet, we give people ideas, places, circumstances, situations. We give them a multitude of chances after they have failed us. One time. A second chance is a one-time deal. Yet, we extend it and extend it and we keep answering the call and we keep choosing to pick up the phone when we would do better to choose to let it go. To let it go. If it failed you once and you gave it a second chance and then it failed you again, why? Why keep giving it a chance when it comes to anything and anyone taking away from our joy? Why keep giving it a chance to remove us from our joy? I guess most of us don't consider all those chances we give away as compromising. As compromising our own choices to live for joy. I mean, but then again, and this is what I realized during this long break from Enchanted Beast podcast is that most of us don't really choose living for joy. Most of us don't know that that is an option. Most of us believe we do not have options or choices. When indeed we do. Like I covered that last season. So if you are just stumbling into the Enchanted Forest here with Alishan and the rest of the Enchanted Beast, you might want to go listen to season four because I did cover choices, infinite possibilities and options. As long as I'm possible, then nothing is impossible. So we do have choices, yet most of us don't engage our choice to do something as simple as live for joy. So let's see how this could go. Ring, ring. Hello? Hey, Ella, uh, it's, it's your past to remind you that, uh, you know, you really ain't all that good at writing and, and, and organizing shit. Just, you know, I just wanted you to remember, you know what I'm saying? That you're not really, you're not really all that you think you are. And, and, uh, you know, that's all. I just want to put that little bug in your ear and give it to you straight. Cause, uh, I know nobody else is doing it for you right now. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye girl. Be good. If the people and the things we need to let go of came in the form of a phone call, we'd send their asses to voicemail quick, fast, and a hurry. But they're not that obvious. No, no one's picking up the phone and saying, hey girl, this is your past. I just, I wanted to remind you 
of your shortcomings and 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 your weaknesses. No, no one's doing that. How how do we recognize then when shit's coming up from the past, things we need to let go of? How do we recognize it if it's not a phone call? How do we recognize that? Well, I know you're not going to want to hear what I'm getting ready to put down. And that's fine because the truth hurts until you accept it. But the truth is, the reason we have such difficulty sending our past to voicemail, sending our past away from us, letting go of all those things that no longer serve our highest good, the reason we cannot let it go is because they so often remind us of ourselves. We seem to have more in common with them than we do with this idea of joy. We we tend to be a little bit fond of them. They're familiar to us. Like we we understand them. They understand us. And I mean maybe they're right. So here's the part you're not going to like. And here's where I don't really care. We attract what we are. And reflection is really a two-way mirror. This is me giving you a couple of seconds to feel the burn, the scorch of the truth. We attract what we are. And reflection is a two-way mirror. So here's how it works. We're all made of many parts, right? There are lots of different aspects to who we are. I'm reading this uh, YA fantasy novel um, written by Tracy Wolf, and it's like a seven-part series, and she's done a very beautiful job. It's a bunch of different paranormals, and the 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 star, the heroine, is a spunky young seventeen-year-old girl who discovers, after seventeen years, that she's not really a human but a gargoyle. I know, like nobody thinks the gargoyle is like some cool ass thing, but she rocks. She couldn't remember how to shift from her human form into her gargoyle form. So a vampire's mind that's living inside of her mind, complicated, you'd have to read it. It's the Crave series, by the way. Tells her to just get quiet, be quiet and go inside. And start looking for all the pieces of you that make you who you are. And Tracy Wolf, the author, she she illustrates this concept of all the pieces of this young girl that make her who she is so beautifully. I just I almost wept. She says, Oh look, there are these beautiful strings gold and silver and green and purple and dark blue and white and brown and black and you name it if it's a color there's a string for it and she could put pieces of herself to each color and then she found the platinum string and that she said she knew without knowing was her gargoyle so i'm gonna I'm going to stick with that, right? I'm going to say we are made up of many, many, many multiple colored strings. Some of them are very obvious to us. Like we, if we saw the strings, we could say, oh my gosh, yeah, that's, that's what my mom taught me when I was five years old. Oh yeah, that's when my grandma showed me how to bake a, a pound cake with a pound of butter, a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, da 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 da. We can identify them and we know exactly how they play in the makeup of who we present 
as, right? Others, not so much. I might see a yellow string and I'm like, I don't know who that is. I don't remember. I don't remember what that is. Uh, it feels like it belongs to me, but I can't really, I can't, I can't remember or I can't recall. I can't find the connection, but I know it's mine. So we have all of these strings. Some we can identify. We love them. They are us. Others we have difficulty with, right? And then some we visit like their vacation homes, right? Some of those like, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That, that hot red one right there. That's one my brother told me. If somebody comes for you and you don't stand up for yourself, then you deserve to get your ass kicked and I'm not doing anything about it. That's the one I go to when I feel like I'm being attacked. But I don't stay there very often. I don't carry that with me all the time. But when I need it, it's there. And, you know, sometimes I have one where, you know, it's a green one. One of my cousins, you know, she, she reminded me when I was coming up, A, hey, there is nothing wrong with being competitive sometimes because sometimes people need to be put in their place. So I have a little green petty string. And again, it's like a vacation spot. I go there when I need to. That's all when I need to. Right? And then we have others that are completely unknown to us. Like we don't even know they exist within us. So if we were to see them, they would look like foreign like other galaxies or the bottom of the ocean and we would say no that's not a part of me I have no idea where that came from this is something else I think somebody's trying to set me up and those are the parts those oceanic galaxy parts those are the parts that keep coming back <laughs> we deny as ours, the ones that don't even feel familiar to us, the ones that make us say, mm -mm, I don't have any of that in me, that somebody is trying to set me up. Now, again, if you need to understand that whole statement, go back to season four. I think somebody's trying to set me up. And then listen to the second part. Well, of course, dumbass, Somebody set you up. Okay, coming back to season five. What does all of this have to do? What does all of this have to do? Well, just because we don't recognize them or just because we only visit them sometimes or just because we deny that they belong to us, it does not mean that they don't have gravitational pull, that they don't attract more of themselves into your life. Wait a minute. What? What are you saying? What are you saying, Ella? <laughs> well, everybody and their mom's talking about the law of attraction, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm manifesting my, my life. I'm manifesting you know, the highest version of myself. I'm manifesting my best life. I'm using the law of attraction. I'm attracting everything I want. I'm focusing on everything I want. And yada, yada, yada. Are you though? Are you walking around with more crystals in your pockets than they can find in those lost caves? Are you though? Are you writing down everything you want and sitting your water out under the full moon so you can charge it and dancing and singing and doing all your shit in a bid to manifest through the law of attraction? Is that what you're doing? Really? Hmm. While we're all focusing on the law of attraction, I wonder how many of us are focusing on the law of reflection. Remember, I said, you're not going to like this. That's why I put it first. You're not going to like it. We attract what we are. And reflection is a two-way mirror. The law of attraction is a universal law. The law of reflection is a universal law. Understanding how these universal laws can help you understand 
the concept of second chance is completely lost on you because you keep giving second chances like they don't cost you shit when in reality they're costing you your joy say what what do you mean costing me my joy all right equitavia the law of attraction where your attention goes your energy flows that's a basic breakdown Basically, here's what it means. Law of attraction. Whatever it is you're thinking about, whatever it is you're focusing on, whatever it is that has your concentration, that is where your energy flows. And wherever your energy flows, that is what comes back to you. So if it flows out, it has to come back. And that is how the law of attraction works. Energy flows out and energy comes back. Now, while you all are doing this manifesting, how many of you still have people in your life who are negative Nancy's, negative Ned's, doubting Debbie's? doubting deals like how many of you still have people in your life who are constantly talking about how hard life is constantly complaining about money constantly complaining about their job constantly complaining about getting up constantly complaining about their partners constantly complaining about everything how many of you have these people in your life who are never, ever happy, who never have a moment where joy is effervescent in their souls. How many of you have these people in your life? Like they are your friends. They are your family members. They are your coworkers, your lunch buddies, your fuck buddies. These are the people you spend time with. And yet, You go home, you get your charged moon water, you get all your charged stones and all your little basil and sage and lavender and rosemary and you do all your saging, you do all your smudging, you drink your tea, you meditate, you do your yoga, you do everything. And yet you sit there and you're like, well, damn, I'm doing everything that the people on TikTok said to do. I'm doing everything that the books said to do. I'm doing what my life coach said to do. Why am I not manifesting this best life? Because you spend 80% of your time with people who are miserable, with people who complain, with people who are just without joy, with people who have no vision, with people who have no hope of doing anything but being miserable and casting doubt, casting shame, casting fear. Girl, I know you want to be a writer, but do you really have to write all that nasty shit? Like, that is just not how you were brought up. You knew you was raised in a church just like me. What? Why am I not manifesting? Why am I not attracting all this stuff that I want? Because wanting it isn't enough. Wanting it isn't enough. Not when you are giving your attention to, your time to, and of course your energy to people you need to let go of. Not not when you are considering ideas that don't necessarily belong to you, but that you have adopted because everybody else thinks this way. And those ideas are holding you back and keeping you bound, and yet you cannot let them go because they are familiar. They are what you know. They are what keep you tethered to the people who are miserable and who are doubting you and who are casting stones and questions and shame and guilt. And yes, all of your attention's there and all of your energy's there and you have about 10% of your attention and energy going to moon water and stones and herbs. 
but you're only attracting where the attention and the energy are. That's what you're bringing into your life. But you, you won't let them go. You won't let the people go. You won't let the ideas go. You won't let the job go. You won't let, uh, you know, the, the meetings go. You won't let the obligations go. You won't let the guilt go, the shame go, the hurt, the confusion, the chaos. You won't let any of it go because it surrounds you in ways that make you feel comfortable, that make you feel needed, that make you feel included. And because because the ego needs to feel included, it's holding on to all of it. It's sitting right down in the middle of it, pouring attention, pouring energy. And that, my friend, that, my friends, is why you are attracting exactly what you are. And what you are is what you're attracting. Well, damn. Oh, I, uh, hmm. Okay. How how do I how do I not attract that? <laughs> like how do I not? How do I how do I let this stuff go without destroying? Exactly. That's the question. How do you let it go without destroying yourself and everything and everyone around you? So, get to know yourself. And then decide which of those strings you're going to actually hang out with every day. Like, oh yeah, these are the strings that make up the very highest version of me, the very best version of me that I can see now, right? These are the versions. And of course, you know who you're talking to. You are now, now that you, you have kind of said, oh shoot, I need to let some stuff go. Then your beast can, can come up, right? Lilith, my Lilith. For those of you who don't know, my enchanted beast is called Lilith, and, and she presents as a beautiful black wolf with blue eyes, very large black wolf with blue eyes, but she's also a bitch, and I accept that. In fact, I, I love that for her. But yeah, so now that I say, oh, wait a minute, I am attracting what I am, and what I am is a, is a confused little twit, and I keep giving the wrong things second chances. So, I know myself. I made peace with all of me. Lilith, what parts of me do I need every day just to kind of show up as the best version of me? Can you show me which strings I need to be holding on to? Which ones can be vacation homes that I visit when I need them? Because they serve a purpose as well. And those ones, the abysmal ones, I need a way. I need a way to identify them. I need a way to actually see them and recognize them. Because those are the oceanic ones. Those are the ones that look like barn galaxies. I need a way to actually see those in myself so I can decide if those things are things that I can and would like to change or if those are things that I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. I think I want to keep it just the way it is. I need a way to identify those things because otherwise I'm going to keep attracting them and not recognizing them. Reflection is a two-way mirror. Reflection is a two-way mirror. What does that mean? The law of reflection says the traits you respond to in others, whether negatively or positively, are traits you recognize in yourself. What? Yeah, there are like four ways the law of reflection works. So remember, you attract what you are. And just because there are parts of you that you have no idea exist, it doesn't mean that you're not still attracting aspects of that part of you, right? And this is how the universe allows us to see our blind spots, allows us to see the depth of that ocean, the, the beauty and the expanse of that galaxy because we are not able to see all aspects of ourselves when we dig through our strings so we have the law of reflection 
And so we meet people, or we come across ideas, or we are introduced to circumstances or situations, and we have visceral responses to them, uh, overwhelming joy and, and, and like, oh, right? So we have four ways that the universe says, here, I'm sending you all these people, I'm sending you all these things, I'm sending you ways, mirrors, if you will, so that you can see you better, clearer. So you see, you meet people, or you see an animal, or you see a flower, you hear a thought, you see a little situation, and you're like, oh my God, that is so nice. I love that. That is great. That is so cute. I am so like down for that. You admire it. It's because that's, those are traits that you see in yourself that you love, right? You see like a dope ass sister, she's walking down the street, like I own this. And you're like, oh yeah, I love that for her. I love that for her. Hey girl, I just want to tell you, you're looking amazing. It's because those are traits you see and admire in yourself and you're giving yourself a little pat on the back when you do that. It's not narcissistic. It's just the law of reflection. And then sometimes we see people or animals or plants and trees or thoughts and ideas or circumstances and we're like, mm, I'm not even feeling that. Why do they got to look like that? Why can't they just do da 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 Maybe they'd be better if they was blah, 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 blah. I would never. It's because you know you have those very same traits in you. They might be your vacation spots. Those might be the strings you use as your vacation spots, but you know that you have those traits in you, but you resist and deny it. You're like, no, 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 that's not me. I would never, like, no. I mean, something real bad gonna have to happen for me to do blah, 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 right? But you know, you know that's who you are. But you resist it. You dislike that part of yourself. And sometimes we see things that just make us go like, oh, I could never be with anybody like that. I could never have an animal like that. If that plant was in my house, oh, you better believe it wouldn't be doing all that. And if me in that situation, me with somebody who never that, it would never happen, not in a million years. Those types of responses, you don't know if you have those traits. Those are the, the oceanic traits, the, the galaxy traits that we, we don't know, we can't recognize. You don't know if you have those traits, but you're scared as hell that you do scared as hell that all oh, that could be me that could be me i love to hear christian say this but god that could have been me really are you sure it's not you though i digress anyway and the fourth the fourth is they belong to you and you're too scared to hold on to them. I'm temptation. You don't like it. You don't like it because you know that could be you. You know you have those same straight traits, but you're not you're not using them. You're not owning them. And so when you see other people who are, other things that are, other ideas that express those things, you are like, oh gosh, no. Methinks thou doth protest too much. So how do we, how do we go from understanding the law of attraction and using the law of reflection so that we are able to see who we are completely, the ones we love, the traits we love, the parts we don't necessarily love the parts we visit because they are necessary and needed at times, the parts that we can't ever see or connect with and now we can. How we use the law of reflection 
to really get to know who we are so that we can decide which aspects of ourselves we want to stay the same, which aspects of ourselves we think, well, maybe there's a way that I can change these because they're not quite the way I want them to be, and which aspects of ourselves we need to simply accept that these are part of who I am and it is what it is. And now we can hopefully get to a position where we can let go of all the people, the things, the ideas, the thoughts, all of it that's keeping us from living for joy. I'm going to take a break because that segment one. So I'm going to take a little break and a little commercial is going to come on. But y'all listen here. Don't. And I mean it. Don't miss this second segment because it is the most important part. The most important part of this entire podcast. This is where I tell you how to make this work. So stay tuned and I'll be back. And we're back. Welcome to the second leg of our walk through the Enchanted Forest. I'm your host, Alishan. Let's get to it. All right, welcome back. It's your girl, Alishan, and uh, we are back in the Enchanted Forest. Uh, Because like I said, before we went to break, this really is the most important part of the entire episode. We started out talking about hard choices and why choosing to let to go is so difficult even when we know doing so is in our best interest now i'll tell you the reason but most of you will call bullshit as soon as these words pass through my beautiful pouting lips you cannot let go and you certainly can't surrender when you're inextricably attached to what's keeping you bound. I'm gonna break these, this whole thing down for you and it's not even gonna take me long because honestly, I, I'm, I'm gonna just go through a few words, right? Just a tiny word nerd girl moment because hello, it's me. Four words you need to understand. You can't let go and surrender when you are inextricably attached with what's keeping you bound. Surrender. It's a complicated word. And most people don't think it's complicated until you realize that it is living in a dual world. On one hand, surrender means to give up or hand over. On the other hand, it means to abandon oneself entirely too. Strong emotions, powerful influence, to give in. So when we surrender, we can surrender and give up and just say, okay, I quit. I can't do it. You can do it. I quit. Or we can give over, give in, abandon one's self to surrender, inextricable or inextricably in a way that is impossible to disentangle or separate. When one is inextricably attached, there is no way to get out of it. There is no way to separate. It's like having a tumor that has grown around necessary arteries. Yes, they can remove the tumor, but you can't live without your arteries. Hmm. Attach, attached, full, 
of affection and fondness. Now, of course, attached also means to be joined or to be coupled with, right? But full of affection and fondness. Bound, which is the past tense of bind, unable to occur, restricted, joined. So let's let's break these words down so that they make they make even more sense. You can't let go and give in to the influence of your enchanted beast if you can't disentangle or separate with your affection and fondness for what's keeping you restricted. What? You can't let go and give in to the influence of your enchanted beast if you can't disentangle or separate with your affection and fondness for what's keeping you restricted. How can I lose my affection, love, attraction, connection? How do you expect me to just turn it off when it's been so much a part of me? How do you expect me to just let go of those things, of the people in my life, of my job, of my ideas, my thoughts, my philosophies, of my 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 likes and dislikes of my of my whole self how do you expect me to just give up and let go of my entire life and then you say i'll be living for joy ellie you must be out of your mind the hardest choice we have to make is the choice to let go and surrender it is the most difficult choice we will ever have to make. Letting go and surrendering to. I think when most people hear this idea of letting go, let go and surrender, most people would assume we need to let go of this thing and surrender these things. No, we let go of and surrender two it's it's kind of like a double thing right you have to let go but you also have to surrender too and it is that surrendering too that makes the letting go possible but i'm gonna give you a tool because again i'm not that much of a bitch there's a universal law that, in my opinion, trumps the first universal law of harmony or the law of one, like all of that, none of it's achievable if you are not able to do this universal law, which is the law of conscious detachment. And no, I'm not telling you to detach from your consciousness. <laughs> I'm not telling you to detach from your humanity or from your moral compass. I am speaking universal law language, right? This is a conscious decision to detach. A conscious decision to disentangle and separate with your affection and fondness for what's keeping you restricted. Here's the hoity-toity language, okay? Basically, this law says you need to learn to accept what is. Some things are simply facts. It doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you say, what you think, how you live, none of it. These facts are not going to change. Accept them. We experience them and we move on with life. Okay? But really, here is the main part. From acceptance, an uninvolved attachment blooms, allowing you to enjoy 
what is positive, what is beautiful, what is joyous, what is loving. While letting the negative flow through you without being affected because you accept that it is what it is. What do you mean? Like that doesn't make any sense. If we can agree right now, if you can just agree that change is a constant thing in the human condition, things are always changing. And regardless of whether those changes bring about joy or sadness, positive or negative results, good or bad situations, it is always kind of traumatizing. It, it's always kind of jolting when we experience change. Our minds, our bodies respond the same way. If it's a wonderful change, we get excited and our hearts start to palpitate a little bit more. Blood flows from the brain, goes down into our larger muscles, giving our heart a reason to pump faster our pupils dilate we may get sweaty palms our mouth gets a little bit dry um, and we, we feel all amped up on adrenaline if it's negative and we're scared shitless the exact same changes happen physiologically we just code them differently right so we can agree that change is traumatic. It is a traumatic experience. We can agree that change is a fact. Things are always going to be changing. What if we accept that? What if we accept things are going to change? Some changes are going to make us so happy we piss our pants. Other changes are going to make us want to curl up in a line, a little bit fall and die. And that, that, those are the changes we need to consider, right? Because the changes that make us happy, well, those are great. Those are adding to living for joy. And we don't want to change those. Like We're fine with that. However, some facts that come into our lives we don't want to accept like, oh, my family member died. Oh, my animal died. Oh, I lost my job. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I don't have any money to pay my bills. Oh, I, I don't know what's going on with my kids. Like, we don't want to accept that. We want to change that and make it something that it isn't when it is what it is. The law of conscious detachment gives us permission to experience what is without judgment, without pain, without a need to fix it, to simply acknowledge this thing is happening. I feel this thing moving through me because it's all energy. And yet I am still here and I accept that this is happening. Not because of something I've done, not because of something I didn't do, not because of something I could have done or would have. No, it is happening because it's happening and I am experiencing it. And it, that's the law of conscious detachment. Now, so what else? How am I going to use this? How am I going to use this? You've given me three freaking universal laws. How am I going to use them? All right, let's, let's go and wrap it up. Get it together. The universal law. The universal law of conscious detachment is, in my opinion, the most powerful tool in your arsenal when it comes to letting go and surrendering. Because... When used correctly and consistently, you have unlimited power to use the law of reflection, which enables you to see yourself as you truly are. Change what you want and can change. Make your peace with whatever you decide to keep or can't change. And then you're ready to use the law of attraction. 
Because once you're okay with who you are, once you make your peace with every string inside of you, the ones you hold on to that you admire in other people, the one you see in other people that you know exist in you, and you're fine with that too, the one that you see in other people and you're scared as hell that it's in you, but you look down into the ocean, you've stared out into space and you're like, yep, this is who I am. The one that you visit sometimes on vacation, you are fine with all of it. And there were a few things there and you said, you know what, this is something my beast has shown me I need to work on and I can work on this thing. My beast says I can work on that. I'm going to work on it. And you've done that. And the stuff you're looking at, the stuff you see in other people that you know is a part of you, but you don't like it, so you dislike it in them, but you can't change it because your bee says, no, you need this. We have this here for a reason. You need these things. So, damn it, love them. You do. You find a way to love them. And now you are who you are, the whole of who you are. And now it's time to start really, really focusing on who you are, on what's inside of you. Because remember, the law of attraction says where your attention goes, your energy flows. Focus your attention on you. Stop focusing your attention on everything outside of you because everything you need is inside of you. So you focus on you. Well, that's some selfish shit, Ella. No, it's not. It's self-full. It is knowing who you are. It is understanding the law of attraction as it truly is. We attract what we are. So we focus on what we are. We put what we are out into the universe. And the universe sends us more. The law of conscious detachment allows you, me, us to let go of our resistance to, to what the law of reflection has been trying to show us with people and things, ideas, etc. Like we are finally able to let go of that resistance because conscious detachment says, look, shit is what it is. You are who you are. Accept it. All the parts that you can't change. Change what you and your beast feel you came here to change. And just keep it moving, girl. Just keep the train rolling. Because once you've done that, once you finally acknowledge, give compassion and forgiveness to, then work on what you and your beast have decided. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I, I came I came back. That's one of the reasons I took flesh again. I really wanted to work on, on these couple of things. And you worked on it. You're doing the work so that you can, can change what, what you came here to change. And then you're accepting every part of you that can't be changed because you realize it is what it is. And for some reason, you need it. You need it in this life. So you've made your peace with it. Then guess what? You get to enjoy the unconditional sense of peace that only self-love can bring. Which means you will start attracting <laughs> people and ideas, material assets, all of that. That aligns with and reflects who you are. That is how these laws work. It is not about attracting things you want. We don't know what we want. We know less what we need. It is about figuring out who you are, using the law of reflection, figuring out exactly who you are, figuring out why your enchanted beast took on flesh, what things they came to work on, fixing that shit, accepting everything else, and saying, I love all the strings. I love all the strings of me. I love all the parts of me. I am unconditionally in fucking love with me. And the more in love with you, you grow, 
the more you put out of yourself, the more you focus on knowing who you are, why you're here, what you can and can't do, the more you do that, the more you attract what you are. I had to take one more break and uh, and I'm going to be right back. If you have made it through this part, the last part's about five minutes, so stay with me. But it is, it is important. This is Ella Shine with Enchanted Beast Podcast. In a world where shadows dance and secrets lurk, comes an unforgettable saga of broken souls. Written by Ella Shine. Get ready to embark on a gripping journey through time, a dark southern coming-of-age saga that spans over 30 years. Nothing is as it seems. With every turn of the page, secrets unravel, revealing a web of intrigue that will leave you breathless. Breaking is the easy part. Having the courage to look into the mirror of your souls, allowing yourself to be consecrated to rise harmoniously in alignment with self and the universe, that's the hard part. Join John and Vivian on this unforgettable journey where shattered souls rise, courage is tested, and destinies are forged. The Broken Souls series by Ella Shawn, a gripping four book masterpiece that will keep you captivated Till the very end. Don't miss your chance to experience this compelling tale of love, loss, and redemption. Purchase your copy now and be prepared to have your soul shattered. Because sometimes the darkest paths lead to the brightest light. We're almost done. Um, If you started out with me from the beginning and you're still here, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and never miss a new episode. All right, I'm wrapping it up. And I'm just going to go ahead and let you know, my wrap up is always going to end with the same damn thing every episode for 12 episodes. The only difference is how the thing can be applied. There's a universal law that underwrites every other law. I'll talk about this season. Like, seriously. I have about 43 universal laws that I myself have personally been using um, as as kind of my, my lifestyle map, you know. And I wanted to share that with with my, my enchanted beast and kind of sprinkle the seeds throughout the enchanted forest and hopefully they'll find fertile soil and grow. But there is one, one universal law in particular that really helped me, that's really helping me learn how to truly live for joy. And what is it? The law of gratitude. Gratitude is my religion. I have an attitude of gratitude. Honestly, the more you give your energy and attention to what you're grateful for, the more the universe will give you to be grateful for. That is not to say that you just you know, run out here and be like, I'm grateful for this pimple. I'm grateful for this zit. I'm grateful for this constipation. Obviously, no one's grateful for any of that stuff. However, if we focus on the things that we are grateful for, the people, the ideas, the opportunities, the circumstances, whatever makes us feel a sense of deep gratitude, that is personal. 
to us, finding reasons to express gratitude, the more you do that, and honestly, the more you will find to be grateful for. But it has to be genuine. It has, it has to have genuine intentionality because you can't just pussyfoot around with universal laws. Remember, we are extensions of them. They are us, we are them, they know when we're bullshitting. The law of gratitude is so important when starting this journey to begin living for joy. Because the hardest choice we have to make is where we choose to consciously detach from our need to resist what the universe is showing us about ourselves through the law of reflection so that we're able to see ourselves without the blind spots, change what we're able to change, change what we came here, what our beast came here to change, love and accept what we can't and be grateful that we are now able to let go of what no longer serves us. Giving in to the powerful influence of our enchanted beasts, who through the law of attraction will attract the kind of people, the kind of ideas, the kind of material assets, the kind of, of situations and circumstances that will attract everything we need to honestly live a life of joy. I don't know if it, if it was just me and the way my beast works, but here's what I found. The more I learned about me, the more connected to my beast I become, the more I, I, I dig through the, the strings of myself and I fall deeper and deeper and deeper in love with what I'm seeing, the more I work on what Lilith came back to work on within herself. The law of attraction is a really beautiful thing because I didn't have to really actively let go of anyone of anything, of any situation, of any circumstance. I simply had to be willing. I simply had to be willing to let it go. I simply had to say, if it is not serving for my highest good, if it is not allowing me to show up as the highest version of myself, I do not want it as a part of my life. I am willing to part with it. I am willing to let it go. If it is not what my beast and I need to move into higher versions of self to elevate the soul, then please remove it from my life and transmutate it for the highest good of humanity. But I don't want it. I can let it go. And I didn't have to actively disinvite anybody from my life. I didn't have to actively scrub my brain of thoughts and ideas. I didn't have to actively remove myself from situations or circumstances because people started falling off. Ideas just didn't seem relevant anymore. I didn't find myself wanting to even be in certain situations. I didn't find myself wanting to hang out under certain circumstances. And honestly, the people that I have in my life now are more closely aligned with me. The ideas that flow through my head, the ideas that come my way via a myriad of, of uh, channels, they kind of like confirm what I already know to be true. 
um, when I find myself in situations, they're exactly where I want to be. And when circumstances occur and I'm like, oh yeah, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need it to occur. 222, 222, right people, right place, right time, right circumstance, right situation. Man, I'm grateful. I am grateful for all of it. It's just getting out of the way of ourselves so that we can truly, truly begin the process of living for joy. So I hope you guys enjoyed that foray into the Enchanted Forest. That time was truly magical for me. If you enjoyed this episode, please go check out the podcast, The Enchanted Beast Podcast. Um, and you can find it anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. Um, there's about 65 episodes, and so they're all available if this kind of stuff interests you. Next week, we will be back with a new session of Black Writer Therapy Podcast with one of my favorite writers, Piper Hughley. <laughs> Cannot wait till you guys get to hear this session. She is truly a treasure. Thank you for joining me for this session of Black Writer Therapy. Be sure to follow and leave a review wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And keep the conversations going on Instagram using our hashtag Black Writer Therapy. I'm your host and unlicensed therapist, Alishan, reminding you to be kindest to yourself first, always and in all ways. See you guys next week. Bye.